wanted to briefly, well not briefly, this video is probably going to be really long. I actually want to talk about the aspect of innovation in this game and some of the history um, and things that I have known and pretty much seen throughout the uh, course of time. So, history lesson time. I've actually been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! probably competitively since 07, uh, a little bit more casually. Uh, since the beginning days. I remember going out to our Sun Coast, buying like two packs and pulling my first pot of greed and first Swords of Revealing Light. Still have my first pot, but not the Swords, unfortunately. And, you know, I've kind of seen some of the finer times in this game's history. Um, so, if you guys are familiar with uh, Asura Priest, Gemini Elf, Injection Fairy Lily, the deck uh, beat down in the early stages of the game, um, probably not quite so innovative in terms of, you know, history, but, you know, Jinzo, Injection Fairy Lily, shit like that, you know, from Feral Sword Event working its way up, was actually a really major time in the game's history, and, you know, playing from that format, you know, Asura Priest was big, you know, Mage Power, Acts of Despair, shit like that, I mean, those cards were innovative, <laughs> you know, shit like that, um, Morphing Jar was very rare, um, I remember the first time I'd ever seen Clown Control. Now, a lot of players are probably going to be like, well, what the hell is Clown Control? Um, Gravity Bind, Level Limit Area B, Dream Clown, Grass Clown. Um, actually, when we first got our first organized play at our locals, uh, our judges were Brian and Pete. And I actually played against Clown Control now. I was just used to basic beatdown, so I mean, to see a deck with an actual strategy like this just mind fucked the shit out of me. Um, and that's kind of where, like, the first innovation started coming into play. Um, I actually played some major event that we had here. Um, we had some local convention here, um, quite some time ago. I remember winning with, uh, Delinquent Duo, Injection Fairy Lily, the deck. Um, you know, as time went on, uh, I remember fucking, you know, Cookie Cutter Chaos. Oh, God, how people hated CC so much. Uh, CC was definitely one of the most interesting decks the game had seen. Um, you know, it was the first time that the online format, uh, people actually communicating with each other through forums and shit like that, everyone was bad-mouthing, you know, CC, and this is when we pretty much bridged into, you know, the scapegoat era. Most people remember Go Control as a very phenomenal era. I'm actually one of the few people that hates Go Control. Um, I lived it, alright, like, I remember Amazon Swordmaster came out, you know, I attacked that shit. I lost my Black Cluster Soldier from my hand. Um, I was one of the few people that hated cookie cutter uh, go control format. You know, I don't know. It, I don't understand the relevance of the format um, to most players now. Uh, it just might be the salt in my veins because I didn't enjoy the format the first time. I'm certainly not going to enjoy it the next 40 times when you people are playing it. So it's nothing against go control. It's just it wasn't a very fun format for me as a person. You know, next we branch into um, Cyberstein, you know, Mystic Walk the format, you know, this was uh, pretty much the first time that I had actually seen people actually playing Mystic Walk and my mind was blown as a side deck tech, you know, but before we branch into any more of, you know, that stuff, um, kind of want to sub-branch here into my love for gadgets. Um, I played Cookie Cutter Chaos. Um, I did, I enjoyed it. I had the first uh, Chaos Ember Dragon, like the badass, you know, kid that I was. Uh, but, you know, as history unfolded itself, you know, I started to see the gadgets and stuff in Japan really doing well. And it really blew my mind to see a deck with Royal Oppression and these little cards that search for each other. Um, I was, like, struck... I was so amazed by the things that, you know, the deck did. And that's pretty much where I first saw my first love for the deck uh, was Japan. And just the fact that it was blatantly beating out the OCG. Um, I was amazed as a person that a deck like that had that much power and paralysis to do so. And, you know, I, I was just like, oh, wow, this is amazing. So I kind of, you know, got struck with it on terms of that. So, you know... Don't be shocked that, you know, my love came from net decking. It's kind of a double-edged sword there. So back to the Cyberstein thing. I actually didn't play too much during Cyberstein. Um, I started kind of getting into the game when uh, Perfect Circle Monarchs was a thing, but a little bit before that, um, I remember fucking just 
some of the crazy shit. I remember a little bit past the Cyberstein format, um, I started getting into it. I remember me and my friend went to a format. It was actually the first event that uh, Baboon was legal. You guys remember Green Baboon? You know, all that giant red shit. He ended up scrubbing out of the event, but he was just catching people off guard with what Nimble Mamunga did. Uh, you know, Green Baboon 2600 feet stick out of nowhere. And, you know, at a time like that, you know, in the Troop Dupes Goop era, post-Nationals, um, I actually played Decree Gadgets at the 07 Nats. Uh, my first Nats, my first Columbus Regional was actually two months before my first Nats in Columbus in 07. Um, I ended up playing Decree Gadgets, which was a terrible medical. I mean, I remember seeing Dexter Dallas deck, and I was like, holy crap, this is so amazing. You know, this guy played Royal Decree, and shit like that shuts down Skull Air, and then I saw what Japan did with Triple Trap Dust Shoot and shit like that. And I actually ended up playing the Triple Dust Shoot build at the regional post-nationals. Um, that August event in Columbus ended up topping it. Um, Troop Doop Scoop didn't know what the hell to do, um, you know. They could open up Blood Nuts, and then you'll just have Banish of the Radiance, followed by Trap Dust Shoot. You know, you'll just stun them to death with the constant gadget flow that you'd be generating. And a lot of players didn't know how to handle it in the Troop Doop Scoop era. Um, granted, it was at the end of the format, you know, and most post events such as that, um, you know, most players should know what they're doing at that point, but some people just don't. So, Trap Dust Shoot was a very innovative piece of, like, my gadget history, like, um, just seeing, you know, the constant trends and stuff from Japan, uh, in general, things like that. Uh, moving up through Perfect Circle era, uh, before, before Teledad, um, there was a regional, I remember Demise, the King of Armageddon, with the, uh, Advanced Virtual Art, sending two insects to the graveyard, Megamorphing, killing, you know, for 8,000 damage with the Megamorph shit. I actually remember, um, I didn't have Wi-Fi at my house, I remember having the Yu-Gi-Oh! video game, and I always wanted to play people online. So I remember we went out to lunch one day, and found out the place had Wi-Fi. So, I was playing on my DS while eating, and I remember fucking, like, flipping shit, because my opponent misplayed, he fucked up, he attacked with his, uh, Doomdozer first, and I milled off Dandelion so he couldn't kill me. Uh, it was the time I was testing Perfect Circle. Uh, Rida, if you guys don't know what Rida stands for, it's Light and Darkness Dragon from the OCG. Um, I remember just being so ecstatic. I'm like, oh my god, Dandelion, my one of, and the deck gets milled, and my opponent's just like, you fucking kidding me right now? Um, he's just like, what a little sack. So if you were the, uh, OCG player that I played that I milled off the Dandelion that day, I'm very sorry. I mean, I sacked you pretty hard on the next turn with Light and Darkness Dragon and shit like that, but... Those were, you know, some of the days of, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! history. So moving on along, um, the Demise Regional. The Demise Regional um, was actually really scary because it was actually right before Teledad came out. Um, that deck was actually really scary to play against. Um, you know, even though I had immediate answers for most of it, um, to me it was one of the scariest decks in terms of what it did. Once again, innovation kind of comes into play here. Um, you know, uh, next we kind of reach into the Teledad era, uh, at least, you know, dad return. Remember, uh, Columbus, uh, SJC, I believe, early 08, um, just couldn't play gadgets and handle the format. I mean, I topped a couple of regionals with gadgets so far pre-Teledad, and, you know, I was really used to the way the deck handled itself, but when fucking... Dark Arm Dragon came out, you know, Dad Return, Ohm FTK, and shit like that. It was absolutely an atrocious deck to play against. Um, I remember a gadget deck ended up topping uh, that SJC, and I was just so mind blown by, you know, the player. I saw the list, and I'm like, this is really weird. Um, ended up, uh, sh I started, you know, picking up Doom Calibers and shit like that at that time. Um, of <laughs> price cards and shit like that. Um, actually had a Teledad deck at that time too. I remember my good friend Bobby Clark, he ended up topping a regional in Indianapolis with Necroface. And I was, I was just so dumbfounded. I'm like, holy shit, Necroface is good in Teledad. And I'd been, I had one Doom Caliber at the time. So I ended up picking up a Teledad deck. I ended up taking Bobby's build and going to a fucking regional. Actually one week before Thunder King got released and ended up uh, topping with Necroface Dad ended up not getting my invite because I ended up losing the fucking mirror match. Oh god, I was so salty. Um, you know, Necroface going through that day. Actually, that was the Valentine's Day regional. Um, fucking, there was so much shit you could do with that deck. 
Oh no, that wasn't the Valentine's Day Angel. Excuse me. That, that's another story we'll get to here. Um, but Necroface and the shit that it did for that deck was absolutely amazing. Um, the fact that you could just disrupt your opponent's malleys and dark arms. It was so disgusting. Um, it was rather amazing the amount of shit that you could do with that deck. Um, so, following into um, that Chicago, I ended up trading my Teledad deck to the Bolitos to get my second Doom Caliber. Um, actually, people in Mexico were just getting gores for that particular uh, event. I remember people were importing them and shit from uh, Mexico. And, you know, the card wasn't legal for Shonen Jump Chicago that year. It was a rather big disappointment because I really wanted to play Gores for that particular event, but couldn't. So, SJC Detroit rolls around. Actually, the first event the Gores is legal for in North America. Of course, that's where I got my first SJC top. Uh, ended up losing to uh, Cesar Gonzalez in top 16. Fucking played Mirwall and Gadgets and it fucking worked. Uh, there was a time in the game's history where fucking... Um, <laughs> Smashing Ground and Fissure were limited. I don't know why, Konami. I don't know why you uh, would do that, but, you know, it was a thing, nonetheless. So, Mirror Wall was hella innovative um, in that format. Um, it caught so many people off guard. I mean, the logic was if I got a Gadget on the board and your Stardust or your Thought Ruler is going to attack, uh, it doesn't target. And it really did a lot of, you know, damage to people. Actually, that's pretty much when I started my YouTube career, was a little bit after that event. Um, I was doing little vlogs and shit like that for fun back in the day. Um, just kind of documenting our travels and shit like that, you know, it was it was fun. It really was. Um, and then, post that, uh, people started to know who I was a little bit. I guess people were playing my deck, they were surprised that someone had two Doom Caliber Knights um, from that era. You know, they were really shocked that, you know, someone out of nowhere actually did good at that event, and that's kind of, you know, what started me on the hype train um, in that format. So, I struggled through most of the Gladiator Beast format with Doom Gals. Cold Wave was just some crazy-ass bullshit, you know. Well, Gores couldn't even handle much of it. Um, pretty much branch up through FTK, or Frog FTK at this point. Um, Shonen Jump Indianapolis, um, Gen Con, I was actually going to top, and then I bubbled out really hard against Aaron Diaz. You guys might remember our Kaiba. Um, I actually kind of sad about that event. Uh, I beat Jarrell Winston. I beat some really good people for that event. And then I just lost to Infinities because I had no idea what the hell to do against the deck. So sad. Um, you know. Oh, rolling back here before we get to Frog FTK. Uh, Valentine's Day 2009, 2010, I don't remember which one, uh, Tier Zero Lightsworn was. Ended up building Christia Sworn um, off of Steven Silverman's list. Christia blew my mind. Uh, you know, you have seven fairies, three honest. Uh, actually, it was three honest, three Christia. Or, no, one Christia, three honest, and three Celestia, of course. And it blew my mind the way that the deck functioned. Um, because of the deck's speed and things like that. I actually ended up losing the mirror match and bubbling that regional too. I was X1, ended up going X2. It was another sad regional day. So, as we fast forward back up past Rock FTK, as my memorous moments in the game, we reach um, Wind Up Era. I actually ended up topping two regionals. Um, one regional with Trap Dust Shoot and Wind Ups. It was like two weeks before the ban list bucket in that deck was insane. And you go trap dust shoot on the following turn you wind up loop the rest of your opponent's hand and your opponent's just like what the fuck happened? <laughs> like huh? What happened to my hand? Um, trap dust shoot was not fair with that deck. It was crazy. Um, and then we get into of course um, the next uh, little bit of the hand loop deck being legal I ended up topping uh, an event. I remember uh, Jeff Jones. I played him in a regional. Uh, Jeff had four back row face down. I have, of course, combo in hand, just Magician and Shark. Um, I top deck Heavy Storm for the blowout, uh, kill four back row. Jeff was playing Heroes. Um, not a very good way to be remembered by Jeff Jones as a sack, but, you know, it happened. So, Shonen Jump Detroit, or excuse me, Shonen Jump Indianapolis, um, recently, you guys remember that top, uh, played Gadgets, um, got third place, beating out Parker Robinson in the, uh, 
the max C challenge, uh, the things I've learned. Um, so we're kind of getting more up to more recent days here. Um, the last really semi-regional I topped was the uh, regional flight in Indianapolis with Chadals. Um, I really haven't touched the game much since then. Uh, Chicago coming up here, I did a lot of Thurio with uh, Matt Nitsko and uh, Jeffrey Torres, of course, and you know, they're very good friends of mine. I talk to them on a daily basis on Skype. We have a little Skype call of like 20 people. Uh, people just come and go throughout the day. And of course, Jeffrey's on DN for 12 hours out of his day just fucking playing hardcore Yu-Gi-Oh. So, you know, I'm usually in there a good 10 hours out of the day while I'm sorting cards and stuff for inventory. But, you know, listening to the thought process and stuff, to me, is as good as playing the game, you know, not being able to really play as much. So I kind of theory out something for this weekend in Chicago. I uh, got a rough draft of uh, a deck that I believe, or at least I hope will work. I'm not going to make any promises. I'm only planning on going one day. This event's kind of just to get me back into the swing of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, I'll profile what we got. But, you know, innovation really is a thing. You know, most of those, you know, events throughout the course of time, you know, decks change, you know. Um, gadgets are a good history lesson of innovation for me. Um, because they've always been something that I've been able to play. You know, yeah, times do change, shit changes, but, you know, that's just the way Yu-Gi-Oh! works, you know? Or for better or for worse, I mean, I'm stuck with the deck that I love, you know? I change as the format changes, or at least I try. I mean, there will be formats where the deck won't be good, there will be formats where the deck is hella good, you know? It's just up to the community of gadget players to kind of, you know, communicate with each other. You know, Justin Delhan, Jordan Nazar, very, very, very formidable names that I've met over the course of time. Um, Nazar, one of my very close friends, you know, I think he's on break right now, same thing with Delhan. Uh, both of them kind of fallen from the game, kind of like I did for a while. You know, in their own right, they all innovated gadgets, you know. And, you know, it's kind of been a thing with the gadget community to get, to get known, you top an event. And then the little network kind of communicates to you and, you know, we pull information from that. Uh, the world uh, person, I believe, from Chile last year, I'm probably fucking up your country and I'm sorry, but, you know, very, very, very <clears throat> big fan of mine, he said. And, you know, I'm a human too, and, you know, you have more credibility than I do, and you're giving me more praise than you deserve. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I'm happy that he likes watching my channel. I really am. But at the end of the day, you went to Worlds, buddy. Uh, you took gadgets, and you did something that I, I haven't been able to do. And personally, I think you deserve more credit than I do on the deck. Um, you know, I do get massive exposure for gadgets. And, you know, even on the Konami stream, they mentioned me as, you know, like, swearing by gadgets and things like that. You know, I just play the deck because I, I know how the deck works, experience, theory, and it seems to be the deck that I communicate most with for, you know, the strategy and shit like that. So, I mean, it is what it is. I can't say much else more on that. You know, people perceive that as the notion of, oh, Robbie, you're a real asshole and shit like that to some people. I don't know how to act. I mean, you would be flattered if someone came up to you and said, I really respect what you do for the community. And you want to give them the same respect back. But you you don't know how to handle that regard. It's been one of the biggest struggles of my career in yu tubing is sometimes I come off as a condescending douchebag, and I, and I don't mean to be. But I guess it's just the general aura and shit I generate. So, guys... A lot of innovation history here. Actually, a lot we've talked about in this video. Um, leave a comment down below. Um, kind of a little bit of the history of M440 here. Um, hope this video finds you guys well. I hope you guys appreciate it. Yeah, I know you guys dislike car videos, but um, it gives me something to do while I'm traveling by myself to places of the unknown stature. So, all right, guys. Leave a comment down below. Tell me what you guys think, and I'm out. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please thumbs up this video to show your support. And please check out Van Cole 40 for Cardfight Vanguard, M. Cole Games for miscellaneous trading card games, and No Limit Gaming for a brand new series of Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. Thanks for watching.